السلام عليكم ورحمة الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين له الحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله الملك الحق المبين وأشهد أن محمد رسول الله المبعوث رحمة للعالمين وأن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله تعالى وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار In the name of Allah, the most merciful, the bestower of mercy All praise and glory belongs to Allah, Lord of the worlds Indeed Allah is deserving of the best of thanks And the most beautiful of praises Those that we say and far above anything we can say For the things that we know and the things we may never be able to understand All praise belongs to Allah All thanks be to Him subhanahu wa ta'ala and we testify that no one is worthy of worship but Allah alone without any partners, the true supreme king. And that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was indeed his prophet and his servant and his messenger whom Allah azza wa has sent as a warner between the coming of the ha- before the coming of the hour and a mercy to all the worlds and a director for humanity and jinkind alike. We ask Allah Azza wa to send His finest, most abundant peace and blessings upon His Messenger Muhammad and His family and His companions and all those that follow in His footsteps and pray that Allah Azza wa deems us worthy and enables us and makes us capable to be of them. Allahumma Amin. The topic chosen for this afternoon was holding firm to the rope of Allah Azza wa Jal. As Allah wa Ta'ala tells us, وَاَعْتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا And hold firm to the rope of Allah, all of you. And as Abdullah ibn Abbas عنهما, says about this ayah, hold firm to the rope of Allah, and indeed the rope of Allah is the Qur'an. This is the firm, solid, unbreakable rope of Allah. Whomever holds on to it will be saved, will be rescued, will attain salvation in this world and the hereafter. And whomever loosens his grip will be destroyed. In this book is clarity out of every confusion and consolation from every loss and strength to stand firm from every fear. In it are the reports of the people that have passed and news of what is to come and directives, instructions for what is happening now. Its instructions are timeless. They never inspire, expire. And even its stories remain fresh as if relaying to us that you're not the first people and you will not be the last people to be subject to these circumstances, to be going through these fears, to enjoy these blessings. So pay attention. The world does not revolve around you. The world revolves around the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his wahi, his revelation, his sharia, his rulings. And this is very relevant for us, especially in an age when we think things are getting out of control and the, the intensity of, of the events and the speed at which things are changing could blur our vision to a very dangerous point. And we think there is nowhere to run and then we need to realize that we're not supposed to be running anywhere, right? except for protection, except for salvation with Allah Azza wa Jal. We're wondering when is it going to stop, when is it going to end sometimes, and we forgot because of our distance from the Book of Allah that so long as we're here, we're still in the examination room. It's not supposed to stop. You're supposed to get better at handling it. And you will and you can so long as you hold on to the rope of Allah. Tabaraka wa ta'ala. In Sayyid al-Bukhari, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anh, says that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam drew a line in the ground. And he said, هذا هو insan. This is the human being. And he drew square lines around it, meaning lines making a square around it. And he said, هذا أجله محيط به. And this is his lifespan, it surrounds him. He's locked in here. And then to the right and to the left of the human being, he drew lines diverging to the left and to the right. He says, هذه أعراض These are uh, 
interruptions, these are disappointments, these are difficulties, hardships that interrupt his comfort while he's in his lifespan. It will not be smooth sailing. He says these are all interruptions, hardships, difficulties. He says when he is able to escape one, the one on the other side <laughs> grabs him. You know, it's like someone trying to type the rope and there's like dogs on every side, you don't know which way to go. And if you move a bit too far in either direction, you're finished. You just need to keep walking. Just keep it moving. You need to get armored, yeah, so you can walk safely and not feel threatened by what's happening. Not so you don't become afraid, because fear is fine. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But just so your fears don't grow to a point where they phase you. And they phase your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala above all else. They phase your judgment. And so when one of them he escapes, another one catches him. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then he told us, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that at the end of time, these difficulties, these interruptions, these disappointments, these afflictions and catastrophes will get worse, will get harder. He said to us in the hadith in Sahih Muslim that. Allah Azza wa Jal has made the relief of this Ummah in its beginning and has written for its end many tribulations that will continue to come. And one of them would cause you to think of the other as petty. Things will happen that are huge. وَيَقُولُ الْمُؤْمِنُ فيه, And the believer in these fits and in these trials, he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he will say, هَذِهِ مُهْلِكَتِي This is the one that's going to destroy me. This one, I can't handle this one. And then Allah removes it, Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And then another one comes, so you call, it causes you to say to the one before it, man, that one was easy. Each one caused you to consider the one before it, petty. That was going to destroy me. But it wasn't going to destroy you. And the believer, by the way, notice in the hadith, is the one that says this is going to destroy me. He's the one that has his concerns in the right place. And that's why he's not destroyed every single time. Because the believer is the one that says this. He's the one that's worried about his iman. And so Allah, even in the difficulties growing, they grow gradually so that he's, it doesn't break him. It makes him stronger as the time goes by. So long as he remains that believer. So long as he remains protective of his belief, his iman. Right? It will get so difficult that the Prophet ﷺ told us that a person will pass by the grave of his brothers at the end of time and say, I wish I were in their place. Like, man, I wish I had died long before this day. There's so much at stake. And he alluded وسلم, that of the mess that will happen is that people will be like cattle. Like there's just so many going in one direction. They're not exactly sure who or what they're following. So many are going in another direction. And you see that unfold right in front of you, right? Someone can have a, a great idea or an interesting idea or a well put concept, a theory, a conspiracy theory, a, a, an activism uh, proposal, whatever it is. And it could be a complete waste of time, right? It could be worse than a waste of time. It could convince uh, sectors of our society to take up arms against one another, right? It could get human beings to kill one another without fully sure of why. Just because the guy in the front said shoots, right? And that's also what he told us وسلم, from a fourth hadith. And he said that at the end of time, يَكْثُرُ الْهَرُجْ that, uh, Chaos, haruj will become rampant. They said, what is the haruj? What is this going to look like, O Messenger of Allah? What is it? There? It's reality. He said, al-qatl, al-qatl. They will be killing, killing, killing. He said, sallallahu alayhi wa to a point where the people that are killing don't know why they're killing and the people that are killed don't know why they're being killed. And so there'll be tons of this mess. There will be fears, there will be confusions, there will be millions heading in directions that make you think that the herd has to be right. 
So you put your head down, you keep moving too. Everyone else is saying it. They look like me, smell like me, talk like me. Right? I'm not going to take on the world. I'm not going to stand up in the face of all this. That will be the norm. But the believer who holds on to the rope of Allah, he will find relief from this distress. And he will find clarity from this confusion. If he holds on to the book of Allah. That's why in the hadith of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, narrated by Ahmed, he said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ma min ma asaba abidan hammun wala hazanun, there is no slave. At the beginning of time, at the end of time, there is no slave, no matter how hard it gets, that is afflicted with hem, with concern, or hazan, or grief, meaning, Hem, concern, you're concerned about what's, what's to come in the future. Grief is something you're, you're grieving about in the past. Meaning there's no person who dealt with a catastrophe or is worried about a catastrophe. And that's all of us, isn't it? You're either dealing with one or awaiting one. There's, when, you, when one misses you, the other one catches you. Remember the hadith? So there is no slave that is afflicted with concern or grief. And then he says the following. And I will leave that out for a second, and I'll mention it in a minute. Except that Allah will surely, will always, this is foolproof, will replace for him with his, with his uh, sadness, happiness, and joy, and replace for him with his concerns relief. That, that dua he taught them to say, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, revolves around the reality of what the Qur'an provides us. And so they said to him, O Messenger of Allah, should we learn this dua? He said, every person that hears of it should learn it. That dua is, Allahumma inni abiduk. O oh Allah, I am your slave. Wabnu abidik. And the son of your slave. Wabnu amatik. And the, the son of your, your female slave, meaning my mother and my father and my grand. We are age old, your servants. We are all your property. Now, siyati biyadik, my, my forelock is in your hands. This is a, a, an expression to, to refer complete total surrender. You know when someone has you by the tips of your hair here? You, you, it hurts. You can't go any other way. My forelock here is in your hands, right? This forelock of mine, it's yours. Ma fiya hukmuk. Your rules on me are always carried out. عَدِلٌ فِيَّ قَضَاءُكْ Your verdicts on me are always executed. Are always just, are always fair. أَسْأَلُكَ بِكُلِّ اسْمٍ هُوَ لَكْ I ask you by every name that is yours. سَمَّيْتَ بِهِ نَفْسَكْ Whether it's a name that you named yourself with. أَوْ أَنزَلْتَهُ فِي كِتَابِكْ Or you reveal it in your book. أَوْ عَلَّمْتَهُ أَحَدًا مِنْ خَلْقِكْ Or you taught it to any one of your creation, meaning your prophets. Or you reserved it back with you in the knowledge of the unseen that is yours. I ask you by all that. And to make the Quran the Rabi'ah, the spring that feeds my heart. So that it can sprout, so goodness can sprout, so clarity can sprout, so Iman can sprout. The Rabi'ah, the Rabi'ah, right? The, the, the spring that feeds my heart. Sadri and the light of my chest. Allow my heart to radiate in my chest and beyond. Huzni and the upliftment of my sadness. Wadhahabahmi and the departure of my concerns. Everyone who hears that should learn of it. This is what the Quran provides. And when a person sees the many things that are trending nowadays. You know, injustice, great injustice, locally and abroad, to Muslims and non-Muslims. Though perhaps nowadays for a wisdom from Allah, we are receiving the shortest end of the stick. But I mean, locally you can even think police brutality, racism, violence, Syria and Burma, everything you can imagine. The rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer, the, the tyrants are getting more and more audacious, the, you know, those that stand for truth are becoming more and more rare. This whole scenario is trending everywhere now, right? 
if you look into the book of Allah Azza wa Jal, you will find the most appropriate subjects for these trends are the most trending subjects in the Quran as well. We have the stories in the Quran that reveal themselves to us if you read them properly as if they are just being revealed now. It's as if you're watching CNN, <laughs> you're watching BBC, telling us about what's happening right now, telling us our story. The most frequently mentioned story in the Quran is what? It's actually not Musa alayhi salam. It's actually the story of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The most frequently name, mentioned name in the Quran is the name of Musa alayhi salam. But in terms of events and addressing in incidents, this is the story of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Every single incident in his life is scattered throughout the Quran. All the major events are there in detail with commentary and, you know, inspiration for us, right? The Battle of Badr, go to Surah Al-Anfal. The Battle of Uhud, Ali Imran. Al-Ahzab, the Surah is called Surah Al-Ahzab. Al-Hudaybiyah to Fath Mecca, Surah Fath, with Khaybar in between, all of that. Surah Al-Fath. Mu'ta and Tabuk, Hunayn, go to Surah Al-Tawbah, go to... It's all there. But it's never mentioned in one storyline. Do you know why it's scattered? Because it's not about the story. We human beings have this problem with our minds or this <laughs> weakness that we get abducted into the story and we, we forget why we're watching the movie, why we're reading the book. We just, we live the moment. We relate to other human beings. So from the genius of the storytelling in the Quran is that it relates it as separate incidents so that you focus on the experience and the lesson and you don't get dragged too forth into the, what, the narrative, the story itself. Right? And so pay attention to that when you're reading the Quran. What was he like, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in Badr? What happened to the believers at Uhud? Right? How did the pressure bring everyone's true colors out at Al Ahzab? Right? What was the real test in Al Hudaybiyah? That's what you need to know. It's not just a tearjerker and a you know, box office hit. No, no, it's not that at all. The Qur'an actually condemns or refuses, refutes the accusation that Muhammad Sallallahu is a storyteller. No, no, no. He's no storyteller. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is something far greater. This is about belief and disbelief. This is about the, the perspective of a believer versus the perspective of the demons, the shayateen. This is about incidents that begin here that are the definition of a straight path that will get you past the hellfire and into paradise. This is about eternity, foreverness. Something completely different. Don't get caught up in the story as if it just stops at the story. And then there's the story of Musa alayhi salam. And I wish perhaps to spend the last, you know, 20, 25 minutes or so just reminiscing with you at our events today, seeing them through the lens of the story of Musa alayhi salam, because that's a shorter story. So we can take bigger snapshots of it and come across a bigger portion of it with the lessons. The most frequently mentioned name in the Quran is Musa alayhi salatu wasalam. Why? What's the wisdom in that? Tell me. Yes, correct. Why is that important? This is a fact about the story of Musa alayhi salam. Why? Okay. Let's say, first of all, because Musa alayhi salatu wasalam, he brought the last book, last major book before our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasalam. That's why when the jinn heard the Quran, they said what? We heard a book come down revealed after the book of Moses. Because the evangel, the good news, right, of Isa alayhi salam, the Injil, that came to clarify, right, 
and revise a few of the rulings of the Torah. Okay? But the original, original doctrine, the scripture was the Torah itself. This is one reason. It was the most recent full book. Another reason is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew that his Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa would migrate to a place where he would neighbor the Jews. Right? And that he, he wished for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa to be known that he is not a destroyer of the legacy of the Prophet, but an affirmer, a clarifier, a completer. And that's it, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He gets to Medina, and there's Banu Quraidah, Banu Qaynuqa, Banu Nadir, then neighboring them, there's Khaybar, right? Also because his identity, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the identity of his ummah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was most resembled by the identity of Musa alayhi salam and his ummah, Banu Israel, right? Even the hadith of Al-Mi'raj, right? That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said he met Musa alayhi salam, Musa alayhi salam even wept when his ummah was enormous. He hoped and thought that his ummah would be the greatest ummah of paradise. But the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was greater, right? And also if you think about Musa alayhi salam and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa both of them had very miraculous childhoods in terms of the events that happened to them very early in their lives. So they were the most resembling of prophets to one another. These are all beautiful lessons we can discuss at a later time. Not today. The lesson I wish to take a bit more time with is that Allah Azza wa Jal knew that this Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would continue to face a consecutive chain of pharaohs like the pharaoh of Musa alayhi salam. Beginning with the lifetime of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Abu Jahl. And even if the hadith is, is confirmed inauthentic that Abu Jahl is the Fir'aun of this ummah, the description of Abu Jahl is very clearly a Fir'aun. <laughs> right? So it would begin with Abu Jahl and continue all the way till the very end of the world till the end of the Ummah, till the last Fir'aun emerges, known as the Dajjal, who says what the very first Fir'aun said, I am your Lord the Most High. Right? And so the story of Musa alayhi salam is extremely relevant to us. Because even though we talk about the fitan and the tribulations getting worse and worse and worse and worse, that doesn't mean that there will not be what? There will not be ease. That does not necessarily mean that there, that there is nothing but bad things to look forward to. You don't look forward to bad things anyway, right? Our Prophet wasallam told us that peace, peace would actually envelop the earth at the end of time. He told us wasallam wars would be no longer existent. He told us that injustice would be abolished. And we have to keep remembering that. That this build-up is a build-up to prove the believers, those deserving of benefiting the globe like this. A time will come when, when a wolf can graze with sheep and not touch them. When a child will put its hand in the mouth of the snake and not be harmed. Our Prophet wasallam said that to us. We must believe that. So the injustice will be abolished. It will be purged from the world the same way it was purged in the time of Musa alayhi salam. Okay? It doesn't mean the exam is over, of course, because they, they unraveled at that point when they left Egypt and were relieved. And the ummah after the blessed generation of the Sahaba began to unravel slowly as well. Right? And at the end of time, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam told us after the return of Isa alayhi salam, right? There will be that beautiful age. It will happen. But then things will unravel as well and the hour will not be established except on the worst of creation. But, that, but it still is going to happen. Right? That's still part of the test. So the light will emerge from, in, from the darkest hour and injustice will be, will be removed after it has filled the world to the brink. You know the ahadith of al-Mahdi, those of them that are authentic, the one who would, would lead the Muslims, 
they, they say that Al-Mahdi will fill the earth uh, with justice and equity after they had been filled with oppression and tyranny. Which means they have to get filled first. <laughs> so whoever thinks matters are going to get lighter, you're delusional. They will only get worse first, before, you know, the, the silver lining appears in the cloud, right? Before the relief arrives. And so let's just take one or two reflections from the story of Musa alayhi salam, just to encourage you to, and me to pay more attention when we're reading the Qur'an. How did Allah Azza wa Jal enable Musa alayhi salam to put an end to the injustice of Fir'aun? How do you remove injustice from the world? First and foremost, the first reflection. You will not be able to remove the injustice from the world until you first remove the injustice from yourself. You have to purge the injustice out of your heart before you're able to remove it from the world around you. What is the greatest form of injustice? Shirk. To believe, to assume, to perceive anything as comparable, as equal to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Shirk does not just mean to pray to someone the way you pray to Allah. No. Tawheed, to single Allah out, the number one obligation in the universe, means to single Him out in everything that is particular to Him, specific to Him. Which means that shirk is what? To give to Allah, to devote to Allah anything, to devote to other than Allah anything that's specific to Him. You have not singled him out. And that is the greatest form of injustice. As Luqman salam said to his son, and Allah immortalized that advice because we cannot forget it. Ya bunayya la tushrik billah. Oh my son, don't consider anything an equal to Allah. Inna shirka la dhulmun azim. Indeed shirk, associating, equating with Allah is a great injustice. It is the greatest injustice. So loving someone the way you love Allah is shirk. Depending on someone the way you depend on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is shirk. And fearing someone, now we're plagued by fears, allowing those fears to grow too much. Fearing someone the way you fear Allah azza wa jal, in a manner that would jeopardize your relationship with Allah meaning, in a manner that would phase you, is shirk. So you need to culture your heart out of that. And by the way, this you will see in the story of Musa alayhi salam is a process. It is not something that you can do to yourself overnight. To teach yourself to, to direct your ambitions in the right place, to contain your fears to a certain size, that's not easy. Okay? That's like a, a lifelong therapy session, <laughs> spiritual psychology, give it some big fancy word, whatever you want. It takes time, it's not easy. So you gotta get started quick. And make sure, keep checking up on your children as well. Make sure it's like that. So that the fear remains contained. The love of other contained. Depend contained. Reliance contained. Give everything its proper size. Because again, it's okay to be a bit afraid. You're not a coward if you're afraid. You're a coward when you give in to your fears. When you allow them to stop you from doing what you need to do. Right? And so how did Allah Azza wa Jal remove these from Musa alayhi salam? The first and obvious one is through revelation. He brought him alayhi salam, right, to the meeting and he inspired him. The first thing he did was revelation. Innani ana Allahu la ilaha illa ana fa'budni wa aqim salata li dhikri. Inna sa'ata atiya. O Musa, I am Allah. No one is like me. No one is worthy of devotion but me. So devote yourself to me and establish the salah so that I may be remembered. So you never forget me. You never misunderstand me. You never, you know, lose that connection with me. The hour is coming. Shrink your dunya. So the, first, the thing Allah Azza wa Jal did is he revolutionized the perspective of his prophets. He improved their insights. That's what you need to do. The whole Quran is all about Allah, who He is, and how to deal with Him, and the aftermath, based on how you deal with Him. That's the whole Qur'an. If you think deeply, that's the whole Qur'an. Ibn Qayyim said that, rahimahullah. One third of the Qur'an is nothing but who Allah is, His names, His attributes, His, his, uh, his actions, who He is, His descriptions. 
And then Allah Azza wa Jal trained Musa alayhi salam to do that with the events in his life. Remember I told you, if it doesn't break you, it makes you stronger. So long as the believer stays concerned about his beliefs, keeps saying, هذه مهلكتي, this one's going to destroy me. He's paying attention to the fitna. He's worried about what he's supposed to be worried about. Every time a fitna goes, oh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not, and he finds himself climbing. Musa alayhi salam was like that. In the beginning, pay attention, it's really beautiful. What some of the scholars reflected in this regard. I am Allah, worship me, establish prayer, the hour is coming. I barely hide it so that each soul can adequately be tested for its, to see what deeds it will perform. Now here it comes, practical learning, hands-on learning. Throw your staff down on Musa. He throws it down, it becomes a snake, slithering, humongous snake. Musa alayhi salam turns around, begins to run, walam He doesn't even turn back. That's how scared he was, alayhi salam. He runs. Allah azza wa jalla says, Ya Musa, aqbil, wala takhaf, inna ka min al aminin. O Musa, come forward. But Sa'di rahimahullah, he mentions these three points about the ayah. He says, but you can come forward and you're still scared. Right? I'm scared, but I'm gone. Aqbil wala takhaf. Come forward and don't be afraid. I can come forward and don't be afraid, but I still get punched in my face, right? Right or wrong? I'm not scared, then you get knocked out. Can it happen? Yes. It can happen. So he tells him, come forward, don't be scared, you will be safe. It's like there's no reassurance after that. <laughs> he gives him more and more, come, come, don't be afraid. Come, don't be afraid, you're gonna be all right. Then he tells him something. The other ayah explains what else he said to Musa alayhi salam that moment. He said to him, O oh Musa, come forward. Innahu la yakhafu al mursaloon. It is unbefitting that the messengers are fearful in my presence. Musa, you can't be like this. I'm with you now. We're having a conversation. You're connected to Allah now. Right? You cannot be afraid anymore. Right? And likewise, though I'm saying this now as a fact, you need to program yourself with this. I believe in a God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. No might or power except with him. Your actions should reflect that little by little, right? You know, sometimes when you see the actions of a Muslim, you believe it's as if, astaghfirullah, his God is a, is a non-factor, is a pushover. Cannot say to things be and they, they are, right? Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, it is unbefitting that the messenger be afraid in my presence. Then he sends him to Fir'aun. When he stands in front of Fir'aun in the day of challenge, right? He becomes afraid again. But if you pay attention to the Quranic discourse, he's not as scared. <laughs> he's made progress. فَأَوْجَسَ فِي نَفْسِهِ خِيفَةً مُوسَى Allah Azza wa says, he found, he detected within himself some fear, Musa did. So the first time, he was afraid and he ran. The second time, he's afraid, but he was able to contain his fears a little bit. But he was still scared. You understand? We said to him, do not be afraid. You will be the most supreme today. Remember my promises. When you're afraid of the sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, is to remember prophecy. When they complained to him in Mecca, he said, Allah will fulfill this command. People before you, they dug a ditch for them, they cut them in two, it wouldn't, they wouldn't turn their back on their deen, right? When they came to him in Lahzab, they're stuck, they couldn't break the boulder, he would say, Allahu Akbar, Allah just gave, gave me Yemen, he gave me Rome, he gave me Persia. In these toughest hours, he would say these moments. At bed, did they come out to take the caravan, which was just a portion of the money taken from them in Mecca? They weren't coming to fight. They were coming to confiscate something that was rightfully theirs. They found an army in front of them that was ready to fight and three times their size. At that moment, he said what? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Take, receive these glad tidings. So and so will fall here. So and so will fall there. And he began to point at what Allah prophesied to him where each of the leaders of Quraysh would find his demise. So in the moments when you're, that's when you remember the promise, the prophecies, review these things. Oh Musa, don't be afraid. 
you will be supreme. I promised you that. Don't forget my promise. Remember. Musa salam, third scene now takes Banu Israel and they leave Egypt. They travel through the night as fast as they can. By dawn, by daybreak, they're at the sea. The sea is in front of them. They turn around. Pharaoh's army is gaining on them. Everyone panics. Pretty much. <laughs> when the two groups saw each other, the companions of Musa, السلام, the believers, they said, We will surely be caught. Today, Musa السلام, is not scared anymore. Not internally, not ex nothing. <laughs> he said, No, never that. My Lord is with me. He will direct me. This is graduation day, if you will. This is a, a, a life filled with challenges, filled with fears that purged these fears out of his life. Right? Musa, alayhi salam, there's nothing to be afraid of now. The whole world is scared. Remember the hadith in the beginning of the lecture about the cattle? Everyone's going in a different direction. It's not exactly sure where they're going or who they're following. The whole world. And he's able to stand up and say, no, sorry, I don't buy that. I, I'm upon clear sight. I'm upon a straight path that Allah drew for me. He will direct me. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So purging the injustice from your life is the first step to, to purging it, removing it from the, the world around you. Allah Azza wa Jal says about singling him out as the only true factor. وَجَعَلْنَا بَعْضَكُمْ لِبَعْضٍ فِتْنَةً أَتَصْبِرُونَ وَكَانَ رَبُّكَ بَصِيرًا We made you test for one another. We did that. We gave some people leverage over others. We made people tougher than others. We made people scarier than others. We chose some be inferior in terms of resources to others, right? We destined, right? We made a loud, destined, wrote that some people have channels and you won't, <laughs> right? Some people have these advantages and you won't. We did that. Recognize that he did it. And he can cancel it as well, can't he? Right? He can turn the table, can't he? We made you test for one another. Will you endure? And your Lord is watching. So when a person is able to do that, you say, I'm not a factor and they're not a factor. And Allah Azza wa Jal just he set up this scenario and he's watching. How are we going to react? You know the other ayah? In Surah Al-Furqan, Allah Azza wa Jal, he says, uh, وَلَقَدْ صَرَّفْنَاهُ بَيْنَهُمْ لِيَذَّكَّرُوا فَأَبَى أَكْثَرُ النَّاسِ إِلَّا كُفُورًا We distributed the rain in every direction. We do that. So that they may realize, so that they may remember and reflect. But most people insist on being disbelievers or insist on being ingrates. Two different interpretations. Allah says, we distributed it so that they would remember. He says, وَلَوْ شِئْنَا لَبَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ نَذِيرًا And if we wanted... We could have put in every town a warner. Like the same way we distributed the rain, Ibn Ashur is explaining. We could have distributed the messengers. We could have given you more leverage, O Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We could have given you less responsibility, more messengers to help you. At the same time, the same way we distribute the rain, we could have distributed the messengers. But we didn't. If we wanted, we would have done that. فَلَا تُطِعِ الْكَافِرِينَ وَجَاهِدْهُمْ بِهِ جِهَادًا كَبِيرًا So don't follow suit with the, believer, with the disbelievers of Muhammad and strive against them, a great striving, a great jihad. And these ayat were Meccan. So the, the, the jihad here was what? The jihad of warning, the jihad of the da'wah, the battle for, for the hearts of the people, right? For the iman of the people, for the minds of the people. And so purging the injustice from your life, number one, Greatest injustice is shirk. The second, very quickly, and I'm not going to spend much time on it, we believe, right, the Sunni belief about this type of belief, right, this, this iman of ours, it's not just facts that you learn, right? Nor is it just things that you notice. Your ability to develop that sort of yaqeen, that sort of conviction, it's knowledge and what? Actions. We believe that iman is knowledge and actions. Which means when your actions falter, it will affect your knowledge. And that's why, very, very interesting, Allah Azza wa Jal tells us, فَاصْبِرْ إِنَّ وَعْدَ اللَّهِ حَقْ 
واستغفر لذنبك Be patient. The promise of Allah is true and seek forgiveness for your sins. Because when you commit sins, that affects your ability to tell yourself, lock your heart on, the promise of Allah is true. On that yaqeen. Your heart like has holes in it, so your yaqeen pours out. Do you understand? You'll begin to get confused about something you knew before. Because the deeds, the devotion wasn't there. So it's not just a factual understanding that Allah is one and only, and we just keep saying it in a lecture. You have to actually devote yourself to Allah so that you can retain that perspective. And that clarifies to us why the Prophet ﷺ would always remind the people to do more acts of goodness before the trials come that cause you confusion, before fitna. Doesn't he say وسلم, He would say, outrace the fitna, the tribulations that will come like dark sections of the night, meaning getting darker and darker and harder and harder, right? Outrace them with good deeds. He says before a time comes, it goes pitch black. A person is confused so much. He says in the hadith, he will be in the morning a believer and at night a disbeliever. And at night a disbeliever in the morning a believer, selling out his deen for a lowly worldly offer. People are like that now. Right? They choose to convince themselves that Islam is wrong simply because the pressure is too much. He didn't have the strength to endure it. Why? Because he wasn't devoted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he got confused and he sold out. And this is something you see all around you. Many of the people that turn away from Islam, it wasn't simply because lack of information. They were tempted to. Tempted by their fears. Tempted by the industry that will put you on every single channel once you leave Islam, right? An interview. They were tempted. They didn't have the strength. Their heart was not armored. And he said in the other hadith, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, وَعِبَادَةٌ فِي الْهَرُجِ كَهِجْرَةٍ إِلَيْهِ That devoting yourself to Allah, worship in the times of chaos, times of fitna, is like, is worthy of the reward of making hijrah, migration to me. And he woke up sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the middle of the night. And he said, Allah has revealed to me of the great events, perhaps of the things that will happen to this ummah. What did he say? He said, go wake up the women in their chambers, tell them to get up and pray. That's the way to secure yourself. It's not just the knowledge and the revelation. That's number one. And the events in your life, yes, number two. But number three is what? You need to actively get up and do something. All right? I just want one more scene from the story of Musa alayhi salatu wasalam and take a quick lesson from it. That lesson, just in case you guys get lost in the story, is that the obstacles that you face as a believer in this dunya, as an individual or as an ummah, these obstacles, these setbacks, these are not outside of, they're not an exception to the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, because sometimes we look at everything that's happening and it just gets really, really depressing. Yeah? So we, we begin to think like, man, why us? Like, can you guys think of some other good news story to talk about? A really good workout or something? <laughs> A weight loss program? Anything? You know? No one deserves a Nobel Prize these days. Just uh, no coverage or anything. It gets like, why? You know, to the degree that sometimes some Muslims them, themselves, again, because they've been distanced, distracted from the Book of Allah, they even begin to believe the most unfortunately ridiculous concepts. Like, as if like Muslims monopolize bloodshed. I know Muslims that believe that. That we're the only people killing people. You know, and because of the television screen, because of what they've plugged themselves into, Paris and California. I don't even want to get into the investigations and the theories. I don't, just, let's say Paris, yes, was a lunatic Muslim who did it. Okay, fine. In California, was a lunatic Muslim who did it. Fine. Do you know there have been, even if they're not at that same large scale, you know, there have been more mass shootings in America this year so far than there have been calendar days. Right? The FBI themselves, they, they say that 2% of the terrorist acts committed in the past 20 years have been done in the name of religion. 
2%. You know when you hear that cystic, you're like, I don't get it. Who the heck are the other 98%? Like, you really can't think of anybody. It's like, no, 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 there's, there's something wrong here, a typo or something. You know, according to the Department of State, since a year before 9-11, since the year 2000, the Americans that have been killed by acts of terrorism are like 3,086 or something. And the amount of Americans that have been killed by gun homicide are like at 140,000 right now. You know, the top 10 reasons for death in America, terrorism isn't even on the list. It's like heart disease, put the bacon away, right? Uh, diabetes, cancer, drunk driving, these are, but it, the Muslims actually began believing, it's like, man, what is wrong with our ummah? Maybe it's the Islam itself that's, that's causing this, you know? And there are, there are people that say things like this. There are books that fly off the shelves in Barnes and Nobles called The Problem with Islam Today and things like that. So when that happens, may Allah forbid, so you're, you don't go too far into becoming an author in this regard, you need to make sure you, you realize this ummah went through all this and continues to go through all this as part of the qadr of Allah. For a great wisdom and a care that Allah has for this ummah, right? And that our ummah has not been struck with the evil eye, like we're not cursed. <laughs> You know, even the evil eye, the Prophet says, لو أن أمرا يسبق القدر لسبقته العين. This is very, very interesting. He says, if anything were to outdo qadr, destiny, it would be the evil eye. Meaning what? The evil eye has an actual effect. Right? It actually affects so many things. But what does it mean if anything were to outdo destiny, it would be the evil eye? Meaning the evil eye, even though it's so real, it's still part of Qadr. The same way you get whacked with the flu, you get whacked with the evil eye. Meaning don't panic, relax. You understand? Likewise, even though it's so real what's happening to the Ummah right now, that is not outside the Qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And these setbacks are actually the hand of Allah at work. Musa alayhi salam enters the city in Surah Al-Qasas. He sees a man from his people, Banu Israel, the believers, fighting with one of the guys from the Pharaonic family. Okay? The people of Pharaoh. The Israeli man from Banu Israel, the Israelite, is begging him for help. So Musa السلام, jumps in and he wards off, he strikes the, the bully. And the Prophet وسلم, said to us in the height of his shafa'ah, and Musa السلام, refused to intercede on the Day of Judgment because he remembered his sin. And the one who Musa السلام, had killed, that was his sin, he had killed him accidentally. I mean, it wasn't really a sin. Understood? The point is he killed him accidentally. The next day, it was a quiet hour on the first day, Allah says. No one saw it. The next day, Musa السلام, enters. He finds the one who was asking him for help yesterday Screaming his name again. Help, help, help. So Musa is like, no way, man. You're, you're picking fights now. Like, you ever again? You keep picking fights with, with people you can't handle. And now I have to keep stepping in? So Musa السلام, said, Innaka lagawiyun mubin. You are, you're clearly a troublemaker. You're the guy who's starting. Allah Azza wa says, And then when Musa السلام, went, to strike the one who was an enemy to them both. He was gonna fight off the oppressor, okay? Even if this guy started, he's still oppressing him, right? And he's screaming for help me, he can't handle it. <laughs> he's the guy on the bottom. When Musa went, this man, according to one interpretation, thought Musa was coming to hit him, because he just called him a troublemaker, right? Musa called me a troublemaker, and he's coming, he was coming to hit me. So what did he do? He blew his prophet's cover. What does he say? Musa, you want to kill me like you killed somebody yesterday? And spilled the beans. News got out. A guy comes running saying, Oh Musa, they have just met in the council. They've decided to kill you. You're going to be executed. So Musa السلام, runs out of Egypt. Wallahi, this scene guys, it's as if you're watching what's happening in the Ummah today. 
a bunch of hotheads picking fights with all the tough guys on the planet, right? And the ummah has to pay for it. Yes? Every single time, the ummah has to pay for it. Let's say all they do, we're not going to talk about the ruling on it. Okay? Let's just talk about the aftermath. Right? The countries that are being bombshelled everywhere. Right? Let's say these people weren't even involved, but they still refuse to get up and say, we, we didn't do this stuff, guys. <coughs> yeah, we're happy, we're happy this, we're happy that. Let's say they take credit for it just to try to intimidate. This is sheer stupidity. Intimidate what? Intimidate who? What are you doing? Right? Am I right or wrong? The scene is, it, history repeats itself. All over again. And then whomever tells them, Ittaqillah, you're wrong, they call you a traitor. Right? That's exactly what the guy said. Musa, you... You kind of kill me like you killed somebody yesterday. You only wish to be the big shot in the land. You don't wish to be one of the reformers. <laughs> the scene. Is it, isn't this the scene? And so Musa alayhi salam is put on the run. And is removed from his people. And is turned into a fugitive. That Banu Israel loses their prophet for at least 10 years. Which is a disaster. But that disaster was khair. Wasn't it? Musa alayhi salam had to complete his leadership training, right? He had to be a shepherd for 10 years. He had to perfect his skills so that he could liberate his people from injustice. Right or wrong? Likewise, what's happening to the ummah today, as painful, as unfortunate as it is, this is the hand of Allah Azza wa at work. These setbacks are not in reality complete setbacks. They are not purely evil. As Allah Azza wa Jal says, لا تحسبوه شرا لكم بل هو خير لكم. Do not assume it is bad for you. Rather, it is, it is good for you. You know, the last thing we, we can say, and I'm done, is that in this incident with Musa alayhi salam, is another sub-lesson. And that is, the biggest challenge we will have as an ummah will be the internal factors, not the external factors our divisions, our infighting, our accusations, our egos, right? If every time someone or something becomes promising in the ummah, we want to tear it down, right? If we are fighting our own success, then we deserve to fail, right? The Prophet ﷺ said to us, يَرْحَمُ اللَّهُ أَخِي مُوسَىٰ أُوذِيَ أَكْثَرَ مِنْ هَذَا فصبر. May Allah's mercy be upon my brother Musa. He was harmed more than this, more than the Prophet ﷺ was just harmed in the incident of the hadith. And he was still patient. You know, of the things that clarify what kind of harm Musa ﷺ dealt with, he dealt with harm from his own people. And if you want to be that person that protects the ummah and reinstates its honor and the sanctity of judge, you know, of, of blood and, you know, the, the presence of justice, you have to be ready to put up with your own people before anything else, right? Patiently, gently, mercifully, right? وَإِن تَصْبِرُوا وَتَتَّقُوا لَا يَضُرُّكُمْ كَيْدُهُمْ شَيْءٍ Allah says, if you are patient and if you are conscious of Allah, their plot will not harm you in any way. But you know when the whole ummah is heading in a certain direction and you're trying to single-handedly stand up in front of everyone that's afraid and say stand firm and everyone who's compromising and you're telling them no, come back, you're going to find a, a clash. And they're going to accuse you before they accuse themselves. And you have to just swallow that. Endure. Or else you're not going to qualify. Musa alayhi salam, he lived in a time when Banu Israel had become very indecent, very immoral. To the degree that they used to bathe together in the rivers. I'm not going to compete with the pizza, I know. I... <laughs> they used to bathe together in the rivers. Hayt in Sahih al-Bukhari. And so Musa alayhi salam is different. He lives on different values. He's someone committed to the Quran or to the revelation of his time, the recital of his time. And so they said what Musa is just someone with a skin defect. That's why he doesn't take off his clothes in front of us. His own people. This is, this is their prophet they're talking about. Right? So Musa alayhi salam would always go off to the side where no one could see him and take off his clothes, place them on a rock and enter, wade into the river and wash himself. 
alayhi salam. This is how he used to make ghusl. So Allah Azza wa Jal wished to acquit him of the accusation, to wake Banu Israel up. So he commanded the rock to get up and run. So the rock took off with his clothes. Musa alayhi salam rushes out of the river and he begins to chase after the rock that's going away with his clothes. Screaming, Thawbi Hajar, Thawbi Hajar, my clothes you rock, my clothes you rock. Until Allah Azza wa Jal makes him have to run in front of a gathering from Banu Israel while they're sitting. And they see his body. And Musa alayhi salam had a magnificent body, better than all of them. Right? Allah endowed him with that strength. Allah destined that he get raised, nourished in Fir'aun's palace. I mean, if Fir'aun isn't eating organic, who's eating organic? <laughs> right? So they saw him and they realized that they were feeding themselves a lie until they believed it. Right? And Allah wa ta'ala spoke about this incident in the Quran. And he said, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu. لا تكون كالذين آذوا موسى فبرأه الله مما قالوا وكان عند الله وجيها. O believers, do not be like those who annoyed Musa. So Allah absolved him. He acquitted him of what they said about him, and he was someone that had with Allah a very high repute. Right? And the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said, "Nothing destroyed the nations before you, except they're much differing." infighting inside your own people and their disagreements with their prophets, their opposition to their prophets. So may Allah Azza make us of those that value our prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and value those he commanded us to value, the people of leadership, the people of da'wah, the people of success. And may Allah Ta'ala continue to teach us from his traditions and from, from the guidance of his book and keep our hearts firm when people's hearts will shake and keep our feet firm when people will turn around and run and may Allah Azza wa never allow us to become suffocated by this negativity and to allow us to remain certain and positive that hope with him is endless Allahumma ameen Subhanakallahumma bihamdik shadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka anabiyyina Muhammad ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in